Let's begin reading together here in uh, Acts chapter 25. And uh, what we'll do is I'll read the first three verses. I'll give you an introduction, and then we'll move into our study. So beginning at verse 1 in Acts chapter 25 and uh, going to verse 3. Luke writes, when Festus had come to the province after three days, he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. And then the high priest and, and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul. And they petitioned him, asking a favor against him, that he would summon him to Jerusalem while they lay in ambush along the, uh, the road to kill him. So when we were together last time, and let me lay the foundation again for you, we, we saw that Paul had been taken before a, a governor by the name of Felix, and his enemies had uh, trumped, up, uh, trumped up charges. They wanted to silence his preaching. You see, a lawyer by the name of Tertullus had, had brought up charges against him. And uh, he had called him a creator of dissension, which speaks of dis, uh, disturbing the peace. He said he was a ringleader of the Nazarenes, which is sp speaking of a, a group of those who were causing trouble in Rome. He, he went on to say that he had profaned the temple, and that was a very serious charge because that's really a charge of inciting a riot. Now, Felix had found nothing worthy of substantiating their claims, but he wouldn't release them. And so for two years, Felix had heard Paul often, yet he never showed any conviction. Acts chapter 24, verse 6 tells us that he sent for him often, but his true motive was a hope to receive some money, a re to receive a bribe. Instead of heavenly riches, as we pointed out last time, Felix hungered for earthly treasures, and the result is, is tragic because uh, Felix lost out on heaven. In Matthew 16, verse 26, Jesus had asked the question, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And so wanting the, to do the Jews a favor, it says, uh, that he might gain influence, he had left Paul in jail. So as we're about to enter our study, Governor Felix has been re replaced by someone by the name of Festus. And, and at this point, Paul has been under a kind of house arrest for around two years. And so in verse 1 again, it says Festus had come to the province and so as the new governor, he wanted to see the, the capital city of Israel. He also would uh, meet with the Jewish leadership, the high priest, as well as his council. And so what happens in verse 2, it says that the high priest and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul, and they petitioned him, asking a favor against him, that he would summon him to Jerusalem while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. And so... Uh, Seeing that he had just been installed in his office, uh, they quickly are trying to influence him. And again, they're, they're leveling their charges against the apostle Paul, and they're asking a favor that he would summon him to Jerusalem under the pretense of wanting to try him. But in fact, what they're wanting to do is ambush him. They'd already attempted to do this before, and so once again, they're, they're trying to do it. The first time they tried to, uh, to do such a thing, is uh, it didn't succeed. In Psalm two, uh, 21, verse 11, it says, Though they plot evil against you and devise wicked schemes, they cannot succeed. And so they're trying to lay an ambush. They want to kill, to kill Paul. But Festus, verse 4, answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself was going there shortly. Therefore, he said... Let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there's any fault in him. And it's probable that Felix had, had briefed him on their hatred for the apostle Paul. And so with that in mind, he made it clear that the proper place for a trial such as this is in Caesarea. Now, if they desire, they can come there and present their case against Paul. So that's how he responds. Verse 6, and and when he had remained among them more than 10 days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day, sitting in the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. And when he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. And so he's remaining in Jerusalem, he goes north to Caesarea, and once again, 
The accusers show up. They lay very serious charges, but they're non-verifiable. In Matthew 5.11, Jesus had said, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And that's what's taking place here. Now, verse 8 says, he, Well, he answered for himself. He said, Neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offended in anything at all. Now, that's what they have charged him with. In Acts 21, 28, they had cried out, Men of Israel, help. This is a man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. So those are the charges. And that's the charge that Turtles, the lawyer, had lodged against him. And so he's saying, I haven't offended the law of Moses. I haven't profaned the temple. I am especially not guilty of sedition. But Festus, verse 9, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? And so Festus proposes a compromise. You want to go to Jerusalem and be judged? But notice Paul's response in verse 10. Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you very well know, nor for, for I am not an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. Festus said, when he conferred with the council, Festus answered and said, uh, you have appealed to Caesar? <laughs> to Caesar you shall go. And so, I haven't done anything. I'm a Roman, verse 10. I expect Roman law. That's where I ought to be judged, and that's where law ought to be served. If I've done anything worthy of death, well, I don't, des I don't desire not to. I don't refuse to die. In other words, I I'm not willing to accept your compromise because he knew they didn't seek justice. He knew they were seeking his life. And that's why in verse 10 he said, to the Jews, I have done no wrong, as you very well know. Now, Felix would have briefed him, and he was aware that nothing had been proven. He had heard the charges, and he saw the worthlessness of the evidence. He says, uh, if I, verse 11, if I'm an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I, I do not object to dying. But if there's nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. As a Roman, I expect justice to be served. And, and if you're unwilling to render proper justice, well, I'm going to appeal to the highest court. I appeal to Caesar. And so what does Festus do? Verse 12, he conferred with the council and he answered, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. Now, this is really a sarcastic kind of thing. This is really a comment that is, uh, is uh, what's the word, is, is sarcastic. Uh, if you want to go, there's no problem. You see, the problem is, is a, a Roman trial isn't going to guarantee justice. But you know what? He was more than willing to release Paul to relieve himself of the pressure that Paul was causing him. So he says, you can go. Verse 13, after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to to greet Festus, and, and when they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, there's a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him. And so he begins to speak to them. He brought the case to Agrippa. He thought that Agrippa might have insight. He knew they didn't desire a fair case, but they wanted judgment against Paul. And so he's presenting it to him in verse 18. When the accuser stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I supposed. I expected to judge a civil matter, not a religious concern is what he's saying. Verse 19, but, but uh, had some questions against him about their, about their own religion and about a certain Jesus. Notice verse 19 who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. We'll spend a moment on this. 
a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Now, Paul had clearly stated this to Felix two years earlier. In Acts 24, 21, he had said, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. He knew the heart of the message of the gospel. We are speaking of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, the idea that one who was dead could be resurrected was ridiculous. And so when he's making this statement and he's saying this is a question about their own religion, about a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive, that was really a sneer. He was really uh, making fun of it. He was mocking it. It was a contemptible thing. Again, the idea that someone could die and then be raised from the dead is a simple, ridiculous thing. His, his attitude seems to be like the Athenian philosophers that we saw earlier in chapter 17. Remember when Paul was in that city, he saw that the city was wholly given over to idolatry and he had an opportunity to share about Jesus Christ and all. He had spoken to the intelligentsia of that of that city, he began to speak concerning uh, this Jesus and all. He, in Acts 17, 32, he had presented to them the resurrection, but when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we'll hear you again on this matter. That's what the world does. They mock at the idea of the resurrection. Now, I'll develop that for a moment. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the Christian faith. His teachings all rest on one event, his resurrection. When you look at the teachings of Christ, he says things that many philosophers and religious people over the years have said, very similar things. He speaks about love, he speaks about justice, he speaks about treating one another with kindness. These are things that you find in a variety of other religious faiths. But the thing that makes a difference is that Jesus Christ, who is the one who originated these things, Jesus who fulfilled scripture concerning these things, Jesus Christ has died but was raised from the dead. That makes him different. And because of that, the idea of resurrection being such a new thing to the people of that age, it was an idea that they contemptibly looked at and said, there's no way that this happens. But we need to remember that from the beginning, when Jesus Christ began his ministry, from the beginning, he said that he'd be res resurrected. And he said so several times throughout his ministry. All the way from chapter 2, verses 19 through 21 of the Gospel of John, Jesus was speaking of his resurrection. Jesus said, destroy this temple. In three days, I'll raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So from the beginning, Jesus said, destroy this temple. In three days, I'll raise it up. They didn't understand, but he was speaking concerning his own resurrection. You see, if he remained in the grave, our message that we preach is powerless to save. It's useless. The Christian faith is standing on the resurrection of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 14 through 19, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. And those who, who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. They were going through so much persecution. They went through so much hardship. Paul had been chased from city to city. He had people following after him, causing great problems. He had been beaten. He had been jailed. He had gone through so much pain. He was stoned unto death. They thought he was dead. And, and then when he woke up, and they, he, they took him out for a while. He came back to the city. He had been stoned in to continue his ministry. If we... If, 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 if there's no resurrection, he was saying, then, then we have the, the greatest cause to be pitied because we're hated the most. Why? Because we're speaking concerning the fact that God raises the dead. That is our hope, isn't it? That is our hope. I was thinking in between services about this one verse, and I'll share just a thought. My wife, Maria, and I have 
have the hope of resurrection. As a pastor, I buried my father. I buried my mother. As a pastor, I lost my own pastor, not so much lost, but my pastor, Chuck Smith. Dear friend, Steve Mays, pastor of Calvary Chapel in the Torrance area, South Bay. When COVID hit this church, it hit us hard. We saw over 80 members of our fellowship die. My friend Jeff Johnson went home to be with the Lord. And last week, Sharon Reese, Rawls' wife, went home to be with the Lord. I spoke to Pastor Rawl this week. I called him and spoke to him. I re- and I reminded him, I said, you know, Rawl, when my father went home to be with Jesus, I told Rawl, I said, you called me. And I've always appreciated the fact that you took time to do that, to bring comfort to me. And I said, I'm just one, and I wanted to give you some time to process. I said, I want you to know that we love you, and our fellowship does it. We're praying for you. He said, you know, we were ready. He says, my wife is in glory. He says, it won't be that long. I'll be with her. He said, the Lord is good. He gives us strength. See, if you don't have any hope in the resurrection, then we of all people are most to be pitied because to be honest with you, many of you have gone through hard things because of your faith. And many pastors and teachers, many who proclaim the gospel, missionaries, evangelists, have gone through hard things to proclaim the faith. Sometimes people think, oh, you took an easy path. You took the the path of of least resistance. You, You know, that's just not true. We took a, a tough path. We, we took a path of death, dying to self. That's what we took. You know, when somebody gets upset, you get angry at somebody, and you're not a believer, you, you can tell them what's on your mind, or you can physically respond. You can do a thousand and one things without regret. We, we learn to turn the other cheek. We learn to pray for those who despitefully use us. We, we learn to pray for our enemies, and even to go so far as to learn to love our enemies, that's... That, that takes the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we, if we had faith in just a, a teacher, if we had faith in someone like a Buddha or a, some other philosopher of some sort, that doesn't give you the strength, the internal fortitude, the ability or the power to be able to, to turn that other cheek, to pray for those. That, does, it does, that doesn't happen. But what has happened is we have given our lives over to one who loved us and gave himself for us, was not only a model for us, but empowered us to be able to do those things ourselves. And that's why through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have hope because we know that we're just passing through. We're sojourners. We're pilgrims. This earth is not our home. And so we have hope. See, we have, we have hope. We have hope. We never say goodbye. We say, I'll see you later. Because we know that death does not have final victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where's your power? We aren't afraid of it. It's an enemy, but Jesus conquered it. And when he's speaking here and he's telling this man, it's a hope of the resurrection. It's the center of all that we believe That's what this controversy is all about. And that's what I'm preaching. I'm preaching about these things. And so he's pointing out that that Jesus Christ is the is the one that he is the resurrection in life. He's the one that he is he's speaking about, but he doesn't understand it at this time. And that's why in verse 19 he said uh, they, they had some questions about him, about their religion, their own religion, of a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And that was the heart of it. That's where the problem is. So he says in verse 20, because I was uncertain of such, such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But, but when Paul appealed to, to be reserved for the decision, decision of Augustus, I, I commanded him to be kept until I could send him to Caesar. And so, I was uncertain, verse 20. Uh, I, I, 
Paul appealed. He wants to go before Augustus. Now, when he speaks of the decision, verse 21, of Augustus, that speaks of the evil Caesar Nero. Nero was reigning at that time. Many of us heard about how that, that old saying, he, he, he played the fiddle while Rome burned. And, and Rome had burned down. Remember that Rome was not a city that was built with a, a lot of stone, but actually had a lot of wooden houses and shanties and all. And there was a great fire that destroyed Rome. And uh, there was accusations about Caesar setting the fire himself. And, and there was a blame that was put on Christians. It was the Christians who, he said, uh, started the fire. And all. he's a very evil man. And when you do even a little reading about Caesar, uh, historians record, for example, that, that he killed his own mother. That he kicked his pregnant wife to death. That he castrated a young slave boy to marry him. And he instituted the first Roman persecution. And this is whom Paul says, I appeal, I will speak to him. And as this is taking place, verse 22, Agrippa said to Festus, I, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. Now, Agrippa had heard much of Jesus and Christians. He's curious about this man, Paul. He professed to be Jewish. He was curious about the Christian religion. So he said, I'd like to hear him, verse 23. So the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and, and the prominent men of the city at Festus's command, Paul was brought in. And so what we have here is an interesting kind of thing that's taking place. In verse Verse 23, Agrippa and, and Bernice come in. Notice it says, with great pomp. Agrippa and Bernice came into the hall with a show of pageantry. Present in this hall are commanders, five tribunal, tri tribunes, and, and the prominent leaders. Agrippa would have been wearing royal purple robes, robes a, a golden crown, golden rings. He may have been carrying the royal scepter. Now, Bernice, Bernice would be dressed in royal colors. So in verse 23, and the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come in with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city at Festus' command, Paul was brought in. There, there aren't many descriptions of the Apostle Paul in history that you do find that there are some who attempted to describe him. History describes him as a, a balding man of small stature, crooked legs, eyebrows that were meeting together at a unibrow, and a hooked nose. When you read the uh, book of 2 Corinthians, I encourage you to do it. 2 Corinthians is one of his most open-hearted books that, he's ever, that you find in Scripture. In 2 Corinthians, he's actually responding to accusations that have been made against him. No less than 21 of the verses that you find in 2 Corinthians are dealing specifically with accusations made against him by false teachers who have crept into the church of Corinth and have been disparaging him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, he gives one of those accusations. It says, his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful. But his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So the description he gives of the way they're speaking of him fits in with history's description of him being a small man, crooked, uh, crooked legs, uh, large nose, balding, large head. That was the description. Now, King Agrippa had entered the auditorium with pageantry. But Paul, a short, handcuffed, balding man with poor eyesight, and crooked legs has entered in, led by soldiers. And as this is taking place, verse 24, Festus said, King Agrippa, and all the men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned to me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I've brought him out before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. 
for it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. And so he speaks and he's rehearsing the situation to all who are assembled. Paul is not legally bound to be there. He had already appealed to Caesar, but it gives him an opportunity to preach, and he's ready. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, he has said, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering, suffering and teaching. One of the things that we get out of studying the word of God, guys, is it gives to you the ability to present with understanding the claims of God that you find found in Scripture. That's why you study it, and that's why you're ready at any given time. God has given to you his revelation, the word of God. God has also given to you the power of the Holy Spirit, and he also gives you the opportunity to speak concerning these things. He'll give to you opportunities that you can open your mouth and speak concerning him. And that's something very important for us, especially in these last days. You need to be ready to give a defense for the, the things that you believe in. You need to be ready, and that, the way that you're ready is by, by one, knowing the word, and two, just saying, I'm available. Here am I, Lord, use me. And so you're to be ready in season and out of season. And so as this is taking place, verse 26, Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I'm accused by the Jews, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. I'm pleased to speak to someone who understands some of the concerns that we have. I'm asking only for your patience. I want to give you a complete answer. I'm not here to defend myself. What I'm really here is to explain to you the hope that I have within me. In, in essence, I want to give you the gospel. And notice in verse 1, it says he stretched forth his hand. Why is it saying he stretched forth his hand? Well, one, it's just to give to you a sense of his speaking. But two, the other hand is chained to a soldier. So he can only stretch forth one hand. And now he begins to rehearse in verse 4. He says, my manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise are 12 tribes earnestly serving God, night and day hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I'm accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? It's well known, he's saying. It's well known by the Jews that I was trained by one of the greatest teachers of Israel, a man by the name of Gamaliel, who was a Pharisee. And when it comes to where he stood or is standing in, in Judaism from the Pharisaic uh, position, he said in Galatians 1.14, I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. I was zealous and on fire for these things, and everybody knew that about me. And so in verse 6, I, I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise. I, I'm judged for believing the promise of Messiah fulfilled in the resurrection of Christ. And it's incredible that I'm being judged on such a common belief in Israel. This is a hope. That was fulfilled in the resurrection of Christ. And that's why in verse 8 he says, why should it be thought incredible that God raises the dead? With God, in other words, nothing would be impossible. Why would you believe in a God that doesn't have the power to do this? What kind of God is that? The God that we have is a God who's able to do abundantly above all that we could ask or think. In Jeremiah 32, 27, behold, I'm the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Oftentimes we think there are things that are too difficult for him. But God says, is there anything too difficult for me? The answer, of course, is no. If I can raise the dead, I can do work in your life too. God made the promise. God doesn't lie. God is all-powerful, and God can bring it to pass. Now, Agrippa would have been familiar with Old Testament accounts of resurrection when you read your Bible in First and Second Kings. In 1 Kings, there's a prophet by the name of Elijah, and it speaks of how he had raised the Sidonian woman's son from the dead in chapter 17. In 2 Kings chapter 4, he would have been familiar with Elisha raising the Shunammite's son from the dead. These are scriptures that speak concerning those events. 
So what he's doing is he's pointing out the Pharisaic hypocrisy. You see, these are people who are saying, well, we believe in resurrection, yet they deny that it happened. It's been said that true faith is expressed through practice. True faith is not just correct intellectual doctrine. True faith is putting what you believe into practice. It's doing what you say you believe. It's, it's that old saying, practicing what you preach. These people said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, Elijah did it. Elisha did it. Yeah, it's found. Yeah, he did it. But he said, why would it be an incredible thing for you that God should raise the dead? You see it in the Old Testament. You see that God has done that. Why would you be surprised at that? And so he's speaking about this and simply saying in verse 6 that I'm being judged by the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. Verse 9, indeed, I myself thought, uh, thought I'm, uh, I, I, uh, I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And, and when they were put to death, he says, I cast my vote against them. I punished them often in every synagogue, compelled them to blaspheme being exceedingly enraged against them. I persecuted them even to foreign cities. I imprisoned believers. I voted in favor of their execution. If I couldn't kill them, I had them tortured to provoke uh, them to recant their faith. I hunted them to foreign cities. I persecuted them. But I've been convicted. God saved me. And God can call and can save all who call upon him. Now, as he's doing this, he's saying this with a hope of sparking an interest, a desire in Agrippa, to not only hear, but to believe. In essence, he's saying, listen, if, if God could save somebody like me, he can also save you. He says in verse 12, while thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And, and when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me, saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Why are you doing this? So the high priest, he's saying, gave me authority. I carried out my assignment. And those of you who are in authority, you'll remember that. But he goes on in verse 13 to say, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven. In other words, this is not a dream. This is not a hallucination. We all fell to the ground, verse 14. I heard a voice speaking. Why are you persecuting me? You're kicking against the goats. In other words, when, when resisting Jesus in reality, you're quenching and resisting the spirit. So he's saying, Agrippa, listen, I resisted the spirit of God. Be careful that you don't also. Sometimes when... The word of God is being spoken to people, and they listen. Their hearts might be provoked. Within them, they begin to think, this sounds like it's true, but they'll, they'll shut down. They'll, they'll even convince themselves, oh, this isn't true. And so he's speaking about how the Lord said that you're kicking against the goads. You're, you're fighting. You're, you're kicking. Why are you doing this? You see... When presenting the message of Jesus Christ, the Spirit produces conviction. Conviction is when the Spirit makes it clear you're a sinner. It awakens you to the holiness of God, but it also awakens you to your own unholiness. In Psalm 5, verse 4, it says, You are, you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. So he's saying, that's what happened, happened to me. In verse 15, I, I said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting, but rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. So he's saying, I am personally revealing myself as Messiah, and I'm giving you ministry. I'm going to make you a minister as well as a witness you are going to be ministering and witnessing, including to Agrippa. You see, he was sent to preach the gospel to all who would hear. And when we were saved, we too have been brought into ministry as, and witness. We share the faith with those who have opportunity that God gives to us to speak to. And I got saved. I hear the gospel very clearly. I give my heart to Christ. I went home. Instead of going into my parents' house where I was living at the time, I walked across the street. 
and went to the house that I was supposed to be getting high. We, we got high there quite often. And I was supposed to be getting high that day. Instead, I had gotten saved. And I go across the street to that house. And the mother is there and two of the daughters. And as I walk in, I, I say to Mrs. Nava and her kids, I said, you know what? And she knew we were loady. She knew that we smoked pot in her house. We did drugs in the, in the garage. She knew what we were up to. She closed her eyes to what her son, sons and daughters were doing. But we would do that. We would just close the door, and the marijuana smoke would come underneath the door. It was filling the house. But Mrs. Nava wouldn't say a thing. She knew what we were doing. So I went in, knocked on the door, went into the house, and I said, Mrs. Nava, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you that I got saved. I want to tell you that I've turned away from my life. I want you to know that I've given my heart to Jesus Christ. I don't know anything about him, but I do know this. He saved me today, and I want you to know that. I even went in after that a few days later and I had been reading the Bible as taught and I found Hebrews 11. And I said, I'd like to read the Bible to you, Mrs. Nava. Brand new Christian, what do I know? But I was so taken by Hebrews 11, the hall of, of faith. And I began to read, and I, and I told her, I said, isn't this great? These are people who believed in Jesus Christ. And you know what? Mrs. Nava came to faith in the Lord. And others, because you, you tell them what you know. So when I talk about how, how I, I led my parents to Christ, I should say first, the first person that I ever witnessed to was a neighbor lady across the street. And then my sister gave her heart to Christ that night. And then three weeks later or so, my parents gave their hearts to Christ. Why is that? Because we speak of those things that we've seen and those things that God has done. And that's what Paul wanted to do. You don't have to be Billy Graham to preach the gospel. Just let the gospel work through you and share by the Spirit with those whom you know. And let them know how much Jesus Christ loves them, what he did for them, how he was raised from the dead. That's what you do. And you, you be on fire, like it's been said. You, see, you just catch fire, and people will drive from miles around to see you burn. When you're on, t on fire for the Lord, you can't help but speak. You might want to put a knife to your throat to try and make yourself not speak, but you can't. You can't. You can't keep from speaking. And that's what Paul was all about. He wanted to share I've been called by God to speak to everyone. Agrippa, that includes you. It's like what Peter had said in Acts 4.20, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Well, verse 16, Jesus said, I've appeared to you for this purpose. This is more, a more full explanation of what happened on the road to Damascus. I've come to make you a minister, a servant. That's what you're called to do. And that's what you're to be regarded as. And Jesus has made you a minister, and as his minister, you're his slave. He says you're a witness, both of the things which you've seen and the things which you'll see later. These are the things that you're going to be sharing. And now what happens is he comes to the place that has caused so many problems. Look at verses 17 and 18. He says, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is your mission. I'm giving you a message that will open the eyes of people who are in the darkness so that they might come to light. Spiritual enlightenment comes through the power of the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, it says, God, who said, let light shine out of darkness made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. He says in verse 18, they're to be set free from the power of Satan. He says in verse 18, they're going to receive the forgiveness of sins. They're going to receive an inheritance. They're going to be children of God. And as saying this to the Jews and speaking of the Gentiles, they must have reacted angrily. But he's, even as I'm speaking, God is with me. He's protected me. I'm attempting to turn you from the darkness. Well, as this is taking place, verse 19, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. God's call on my life to preach the gospel was immediately acted upon, and, and I preached from, place, from the place I was saved, and I moved on from there. 
and I was preaching, repent, turn to God, do works that demonstrate repentance, change your mind, change your direction, and change your life habits. And that's what happens when you repent. You're a different person. Well, for these, re- for these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple, tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I stand witnessing both the small and great, saying, no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. I'm simply presenting what Scripture says concerning Messiah. That's all he's saying. Now, verse 24, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, duh. No, and Paul said, I would, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. When he had said these things, the king stood up as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves saying, this man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Well, when it says in verse 24, Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. Paul, to speak of men rising from the dead, that's crazy. And you have been reading too much. Your books and your learning have led to insanity. But he went on to say, no, I'm not. My, my words are true. My words are sober-minded. And by the way, you're familiar with what I'm saying. And the things that have taken place, they haven't been done in secret. And notice in verse 27 how he goes to the heart of it. Listen, it's not enough for Paul to give the message. He now is driving to the conclusion. Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Agrippa... You are familiar with Scripture, and you have professed to be a follower of those things that Scripture says. Agrippa, this is your moment. Agrippa, this is what we today would refer to as an invitation or perhaps an altar call. This is your opportunity. I really believe very strongly in giving people opportunity to come to follow Christ. Agrippa is saying, listen, all these years that you've been pouring over those scriptures and all of that, it's really twisted the way that you think. And Paul says, oh no. No, these are things that you know in scripture are true. The question is, is do you believe and listen? You can come from the background I did, and again, I'll I'll, I'll remember out loud before you. I believed in God. I believed in the Father Almighty. I believed he was the creator of heaven and earth. I believed in Jesus Christ, his only son, begotten of the Holy Spirit. I believed that he was born of the virgin, that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, that he was crucified, and that he died. I believe that he was raised from the dead the third day and he ascended into heaven and he is seated at the right hand of the Father from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I was taught that. I learned the Apostles' Creed when I was seven years old. And to this day, I still can recite it because that is a doctrine of our faith. And I said it, I believe, I believe, I believe. And I didn't believe because what you believe you do. What you believe is what makes you live. And there are a whole lot of people who say, oh, no, I believe those things. Oh, really? 
do you really, are you living according to your beliefs? And you would say, yes, I am. And I would say, yes, you are too. If you don't know the Lord, your beliefs tell me what you really do believe in. The way you're living tells me what your beliefs are. People say, oh, you Christians, you guys are crazy. You believe this. Really? It's a great philosophy. I think it's okay. I mean, you know, just don't hurt anybody else with it. But, but here's your problem. The Bible says go into all the world and preach the gospel. We're not to sit on our hands and let other people do it. We're supposed to be taking this to as many as we can. Why? Because it's the only message that changes life. It's the only message that transforms people. It's the only message that will save a family. It's the only message that will make a man what he's supposed to be, a woman what she's supposed to be, and what children are supposed to be. It's the only message. See, that's the problem. It's a huge problem. And so when Paul is speaking there, he's saying, this is your opportunity. I know you believe. I know you've read these things. I know you're familiar with these things. Are you willing to commit yourself to these things and to be counted as one who follows Christ no matter where he sends him? That's the key. I believe very strongly that this nation needs transformation, but it's not going to come through a new president. It comes through a Messiah. It comes through a Savior, one who changes lives from within, which changes a nation from within. Cannot elect righteousness. You live righteousness, and you give a message that produces righteousness, and it transforms the people. That's why we have to be very careful to do the things we have, we have the ability to do. Paul is presenting his case to the government. We should present our case too. Of course, we should vote. Of course, but we don't trust in man. We trust in God who changes the hearts of men so that a nation can be changed and saved because the gospel transforms. That's why I concentrate on those things, because that's what saved my parents. That's what saved my sisters. That's what saved my brother. That's what saved the girl who became my wife. That's what saved my children. That's what will save my grandchildren. That's what saved my friends. That's what will save this nation, is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I really believe we need to remember that. And so notice as we close that Agrippa said, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. You're trying to make a, a Christian out of me with very few words. And by the way, on slender grounds, I, I, I reject this invitation. You think that I can be changed and convinced by one, one message? Well, the answer to that is yes. Yes, by one message. You're trying hard to convince me, Paul, but I don't want any part of it. And so he doesn't receive, he rejects. And what happens? Well, we'll close. When he said these things, verse 30, the king stood up, while as the governor of Bernice, and those who sat with them, they went aside, they talked. This man is doing nothing, deserving of death or chains. Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. I can't let him go. He's going to have to take the route that he's chosen for himself. He could have been set free. But Paul was determined to preach the gospel to all would hear. And if he had an opportunity to speak to this corrupt man by the name of Nero then God help me as they do so. Because he needs to hear the truth that can set him free too. They wanted to let him go. They would have let him go, but he made an appeal. Because Paul said, I'm willing not only to go to Rome, but I'm also willing to die at Rome for the truth of the gospel. I pray that the Lord will burn that into my own heart to be willing to go wherever he calls me and to do whatever he calls me to do for the gospel's sake. I pray that not only for myself, but for every genuine believer in Jesus Christ, that we would be willing to do whatever it takes to see people saved.